Hey everyone, thanks so much for tuning in. Cross and Crown Channel is about presenting powerful proof for the Christian faith. If you want to support Mike as he makes videos and writes books, just go to Mike's Patreon page at patreon.com backslash mrob and kick in a buck or so. If you join us over there, that would be awesome. Supporting this work will help bring countless people to Christ. If you like this video, there's a donation button on our main YouTube page. Thanks for hanging out. Go to the Patreon page if you have a chance in the description. But God is light. Now, what does that mean? It means many different things, very important things. In at least one sense, light represents the goodness of God, and it's the antithesis of evil that's associated with darkness. That's what you see in Scripture over and over. It also makes common sense. God is the ultimate good. He is the light. Light also symbolizes the holiness of God, his holiness. Some have said his uh, the Shekinah glory of God, if you will. That's not a biblical term, although a lot of Christians think it is, but it does seem to convey some biblical truth about God's presence coming and the holiness of God when he appears in that form, uh, coming in power and glory. So um, that's a particular term some people use. But light signifies God's presence and his favor. You can see that in Psalm 27, as well as Isaiah chapter 9, when it talks about Christ and his ministry. Light is connected with God and his word and salvation, with goodness, with truth, and with life. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 6 that God lives in unapproachable light. So God is light. Uh, the Father is a father of lights. And God's glory and his holiness dissipate darkness. That's one reason sin cannot get to heaven. If you ever are talking to somebody and they have a really difficult time thinking, well, why is Christianity the only way to God? Is it just that... It's like a football fan. You like USC and I like UCLA. You like uh, Crimson and I like Alabama. Is that how it works? What's going on with that type of thing? And so it's not that with Christians. It's not just my team is better than your team. I root for my team and I want your team to lose. It's not a matter of that. It's a matter that heaven's perfect because God is perfect. He's absolutely holy and righteous. And nobody with sin can enter heaven. Picture this. If heaven is absolutely perfect, and it is, and God allows sin or unrighteousness in heaven, then what happens down here on earth with all the sin is going to happen also in heaven. God cannot allow that. So God is absolutely holy, and we need a remedy. We need a way to get rid of our sin, and that, of course, is the cross of Jesus Christ. Those who trust in him, believe in Jesus Christ, died on the cross, and rose again. The blood of Christ washes away all your sins. You're imputed with the righteousness of Christ, so you get to go to heaven you get to enter the perfect, spotless, flawless heaven because of your sins are washed away. Nobody can enter heaven without that as being the case. Now, Jesus declares that he is the light of the world and that the Bible also says that Jesus is a logos of God. And that's really important. Hello, Michael. It's good to see you out there. How's things going there up there past Benbrook? It's good to see you, my friend. And so he's the logos. And he calls people to believe in him because he is the Messiah. He's the anointed one. Through the word of God, light came into existence. So the Logos, Jesus, God speaking the word, let there be light, created light throughout the physical universe. But it's a reflection of God's ontology. Ontology is that fancy term that discusses God's nature. An aspect of God's nature, obviously, is light. And through the revelation of God in Jesus, Christ, the word, brought light into humanity. So believers are called the sons of light. You can see that in John chapter 12 as well as Ephesians chapter 5. Light possesses powers essential to true life. Without light in this planet, we would not have life. And so God said, let there be light, and there was. Now, Satan, we have to be careful, can disguise himself as an angel of light. We have to be careful when discerning what church to go because certain ministers might not be who they seem to be. So we don't want to get paranoid about that. We don't want to be overly judgmental, but you have to go into any church or any religious activity with discernment. Discernment, in other words, you want to find out what is light and what is darkness. Some of these things are common sense, but very, very important. I appreciate all those prayers, Nicholas. I need them. We all need them and so grateful for those, Nicholas. I hope things are going for, well for you too, my friend. Ephesians 5, chapter, or verse 8 through 9 says, For once you were in darkness, but now the Lord in you, you are light. Live as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good, right, and true. So the Christian life is one that is a life of 
light. And so light moves darkness. Darkness doesn't move light, which is important when you think about the authority and the rights and the privileges that we have as humble servants of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we are here on earth. One reason for that, that we didn't go directly to heaven when we got born again, is so that we can share the light, the truth, and the love of Jesus. That's what we're here to do as far as congregations, being members of those, as well as being those who are individuals out there in our community, in our family, in our marketplace, to share the light and the love of Christ. Job chapter 38 says this, where does light come from? Where does darkness come from? Now this has scientific implications that we're going to get into right now. We're going to break this down into some really important stuff. A lot of people don't understand this, but Job is probably the oldest book in the Bible. It predates the Pentateuch. We can tell by the style of Hebrew writing that it's in. So Job is probably the oldest book in the Bible, and it has fascinating scientific truth to it that people in sandals walking across the desert without telescopes or microscopes could never have known on their own. Some incredibly intelligence must have told them and revealed these things to them. And of course, that's the case, God revealing his truth to them. Another translation of that verse says, where is a way where light dwells? And as for darkness, where is its place? Where does light come from? Where does darkness come from? The Hebrew word for way for the light is often used to mean road. So what's interesting here, and this has scientific implications, is it seems to be suggesting that there's a road or a way for light to go. Now here's something for you to think about. We're going to bring a little bit of an exposition to it in a little bit. Light, when it goes through water, or goes even through air, or goes through glass, slows down. Most people know it's 186,000 miles plus uh, per second, uh, a mile per second, right? So it's very, very fast. Slows down a little bit in water, slows down a little bit as it goes through glass and other such media. What's interesting about that is that once the light goes through the media, whether it's glass or it's water or what have you, it then regains its normal speed. So it slows down as it goes to the media, and then as it gets out of the media, it goes back to its normal speed, which is fascinating because there's nothing that we know of in the entire physical universe that can slow down because it, 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 it went into some kind of obstacle or some kind of media that's going to slow it down and then it can regain its speed on its own without anything of bringing forth more energy within it. Only protons from light can do that. In other words, if your car starts slowing down, unless you add more energy to it because it's slowing down as you're driving through mud, it's not gonna gain up speed right? It loses it. Now we're going to cover that in just a little bit. But this verse seems to open the door wide that light does travel in this way. So light travels in a vacuum, that's in a vacuum, with nothing there at 186,282.4 miles per second, pretty fast. Through water it slows down to 139,808 miles per second. Through a diamond, this is interesting, almost 78,000 miles per second. So it go, uh, light goes through those media and it slows down as it's going through it. And so um, that's really fascinating because light can act as a wave normally, but it can also act as a particle, sometimes at the same time in the same way, which is also interesting. We're gonna break that down a little bit also. If light travels in a straight line, it's gonna do that unless something comes across it. Light can also be transparent, or it can go through transparent things like glass or water, and it changes. Like you can see when you put a straw in a glass, just put a straw in a glass, and because of the refraction, the straw doesn't look straight as you put it in there. Same with putting an oar in a pond, right? When you look there, because of the refraction of light, it, it distorts how you look at the straw or the oar. Rainbows work in a similar way on bending light as well. God designed different colors of light to bend. When white light passes through a prism, the purple gets bent the most and the red the least. And that's one reason there's a rainbow. This allows the light to spread apart so that we can see each color on its own. The Bible says in Genesis chapter one, that God saw the light and that it was good and that God divided the light from the darkness. In the year 1900, Planck showed that light energy must be emitted and absorbed in distinct quanta, 
Okay, now we're getting to science. We're going to break this down. Some of these things might sound a little heady. You might want to change the channel, but we're going to break it down. You're going to understand these things, and you're going to see what a great delight all this information is on who your God is and how wonderful he is and his nature and his being. So the, the quanta was you was found to explain the what's called the black body radiation. You don't need to know what that is right now. In 1905, Einstein showed that the energy of light is determined by its frequency. I'm going to draw all this together. In the 1920s, G. Broglie and others introduced the concept of standing waves to explain these discrete frequency and energy states of light and matter. In 1925, Heisenberg and Dirac and others made different important discoveries related to the quantum field. And this, of course, is part of the foundation of modern physics. So this is important. Now, here's the paradox that nobody's been able to explain. The paradox is that light can behave as a particle or a wave at the same time in the same place, which makes no sense. It's a paradox. Now, when people say, well, you know, I can't believe in Christianity because of Trinity. Such a paradox. It just makes no sense. Well, keep in mind, light, we have to deal with every single day on the earth, right? It affects everything we see and everything we do, how we live, how we move. Light has to do with everything on the planet and in the universe. Yet light itself, something as simple as light and as important as light and essential to in the physical universe as light, just the physical universe, we can't explain how it can be a particle and a wave at the same time. We can't do that. Nobody's been able to. It's just the case. And so when people say, well, how can God be one being yet the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three persons? Well, it's a paradox. It's not illogical. It's just something we can't wrap our mind around, but we also can't wrap our mind around light. You can't wrap your mind around time either. Why is time past, present, and future? We're not going to discuss that tonight, but there's a whole host of things just in our physical cosmos that are paradoxes that we can never, ever explain. And many, many scientists admit this. It's not just the God of the gaps. Our, our, there's a place where the finite bumps up to the infinite and we cannot explain certain things. It's just in principle, not possible. Okay. So the Trinity though, even though it may be a paradox, has great explanatory power. In other words, the Trinity has to be. God must be Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God. Why? Because of the problem of the one and the many. This is a problem that philosophers and theologians and scholars have dealt with since the early Greeks. And it's been a problem when you look it up in, in certain encyclopedias of philosophy, they still don't have an answer for it. The answer, of course, is found in God, the God revealed in Scripture, which is really interesting. Again, the problem is called the problem of the one and the many, or unity in diversity. Let me break it down. This is actually very simple to understand. It's something we all take for granted. We, we live and we're walking around and we're doing things and saying things, and we never think about these things. But when I open it up to you, you're going to understand it really easily. One and the many, a unity in diversity, the problem the philosophical problem of the one and the many is answered by God. What do I mean? Okay, I'm one human being, Mike, among many human beings on the planet. So one and the many, right? So there's many humans and I'm just one. So there's a one and many as far as humans concerned. Hello, Lance. So good to have you. Now, within me, within my one body, the one, there's many organs, the one and the many. So one me, one body yet many organs. Now each organ, each one organ, let's say the heart, each heart has many different cells. Okay, so one and many. One heart, many cells. You can see it, it affects everything in the universe. Here we go. Each cell is made up of many molecules. One cell, many molecules. Each molecule, each one molecule, the one and the many, is made up of many atoms. And you can keep going and you drill down and they have never dri drilled down far enough. So the one in many we can see with a, a, human, a human, right? You can also see it with the universe. You look at the universe and it's one universe. Unity and diversity. That's where the name came from. Universe. One cosmos. One universe. Unified diversity. So there's one universe with many different galaxies, right? So one and many. One universe, many galaxies. 
Each galaxy has many solar systems. One galaxy, many solar systems. Each solar system has many planets. One solar system, many planets. One and the many. Okay, I think you're, tra you're tracking now. Each planet is made up of many parts of the planet. Say mountains. Each mountain is made up of many rocks. Each rock is made up of many particles. Each particle is made up of many molecules. Each molecule, one molecule is made up of many atoms. So you can see how it goes. Books. One book, right? I have one book among many books in on the, on the earth. Okay? So the one and many. One book among many. I open the one book up and it has many chapters. One book, many chapters. This is the problem of the one and many. It affects every single thing in our world. One book, many chapters. Each chapter, many paragraphs. One chapter, many paragraphs. The one and the many. Each paragraph, each one paragraph, many words. Each word, many letters. And so you can see everything that we're about, everything that we do, touches the one and the many. Now, why is that the case? Because the foundation for all reality is God, who is one and yet many. Diversity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. A monad God, a, a just a singular unity God, could not account for the one and the many. But the God of Scripture, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three persons in one God, is a foundation for the one and many, which is the ultimate problem in all philosophy, and the God of Scripture answers that and solves that problem. So that's powerful. So when people say, well, you know, there's paradoxes in God, so I can't believe the Christian God, you know, the paradox in the Trinity. Well, we just covered that paradox with light. Light can be both wave and particle at the same time. That's a paradox that in principle cannot be solved. Yet we know it's true. We've seen it true. It's been proven to be true. And yet it's something that we cannot understand. So we cannot understand many, many things and never will in principle understand them. It's not surprising that we can't understand God who created all things. God is infinite. All these things are finite. So that's really interesting. Now, when you think about light, think about this. Let me read this paragraph from you. And you can get this from my book, um, Science Requires God. Okay, you can get that on Amazon if you want. Science Requires God. It is sometimes suggested that Newton's law of inertia, according to which a body in motion will remain in motion unless it's acted upon by outside forces. Now, keep that in mind. So, the body will keep moving forward unless it's acted upon. That could be gravity. That could be something physical, like a, a ball rolling on a physical table. The table will slow down the rolling of the ball. This just makes sense. doesn't work with, with light. Once light hits a media, whether it's glass or water, it will slow down. But once it's through the media, it's the only substance in the universe that then regains its normal speed without any added energy that's amazing that's phenomenal there's no way to solve that uh, go on to say this it's a maximum of science that light moves at a constant 186,000 miles per second and yet what is even perplexing more or what is more perplexing is that light does not need its immediate source for power light sh slows down through a denser media of air, water, or glass, but upon emerging on the other side of any one of those media, the light instantly accelerates back to its precise former velocity of 186,000 miles per second. If you throw a baseball through a plate of glass window, the baseball, let's say it's going at 100 miles an hour, it hits a glass, it slows down, and it keeps slowing down. It does not regain its speed of 100 miles an hour unless added energy was given to it. That just doesn't happen. But light, the protons, regain their speed. And no scientist can find the reason why this is. A lot of protons don't have little jet packs on the back of them. Something has them regain their speed, and the speed of light is constant. That is amazing. That's astounding. And it seems in principle that that cannot be solved either. We don't know for sure. It could be, you know, in a sense what uh, atheists could say, well, that's just a God in the gaps argument. Perhaps. Perhaps scientists will find the reason for that. But always remember a description of what something is and what something is doing is not telling us what it is. Okay. It's just a description. Okay. Ultimately, you have to go to God and his revelation to find out what it is. So, that's light. You can get more, like I said, on my book, Science Requires God. 
to, to know through that. Now, what about our own life? You know, you're, you're trying to go forward in life. You want to see God work in your life. How do you do it? I would suggest memorizing important scriptures. I, 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 I would not encourage you to be the type of person that is a kind of a um, word faith person, you know, just declaring things into existence, that kind of thing. No, only God can declare things in existence. God alone is a creator. We are not. You don't want to have faith in your faith, okay? You don't want to think that your words have magic power. They don't. God is control and he's sovereign. But yet there's a place to build confidence. There's a place to build your faith. There's a place to go forward and advance by the power of God in your life. Matthew 19, 26, Jesus said this, with men it's impossible, but with God all things are possible. So that should be our starting point that we understand, wait a minute here. Hello, Mark, so good to have you tonight. With me, it's impossible. That's where I that's my main presupposition in my life, in my sanctification, in my Christian growth, as well as my pursuits in my career, my ministry, my business, my education, my personal life. I have to start with, with man, that's me, it's impossible, but with God, all things are possible, okay? Then Paul said this, brothers, I... I do not count myself to apprehend, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind me, reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So notice, it's always in Christ. It's a matter of being in Jesus and not yourself. You don't want to do this. So let me give you a few tips before we get into some practical application of how to see more advancement occur. Some of these are going to be really simple but powerful. Some things I think you might not have heard of uh, for your education, for your career, for a business startup, for perhaps you want to enlarge your, your social media platform. My social media platform took off just a little bit over a year ago. Uh, we started our YouTube channel, then we started doing uh, videos on Facebook a little over a year ago. We worked it from 10 views, 20 views, 50 views, to thousands of views. Our last view here on Facebook, our last video got over 11,000 views. So that's just in a year and a half. So there's certain things you can do as an average person with the, the tremendous resources we now have with social media. You don't want to get involved in idolatry and getting too involved in all that kind of stuff. But there's certain practical things that you can put in your life to perhaps increase your social media platform. But let's get into your health first. A lot of you know that I'm a certified nutritionist. And I like to give nutritional tips. I don't spend too much time on this. This is only take a couple of minutes. It's some things that you probably know about a little bit, but perhaps I can enlighten you and give you a fuller exposition on some of the benefits of nuts. Nuts, the best nut you can possibly eat for most people are walnuts. Walnuts are powerful. They keep your blood sugar balanced. They give you energy. They can fill you up. They're a little expensive. And here's the key. When you, when you read about these things, you want to talk to a certified nutritionist or an advanced doctor in the nutritional field. Why? Because there's so many things that are involved that when you read an article about how walnuts are good for you, you might not have heard something like this. Walnuts are very, very good for you, but they also go bad and rancid relatively fast outside the shell. So you don't want to buy them de-shelled if at all possible. Okay? You want to buy them shelled. That's what I have. I have shelled walnuts on my table and one of those crackers, you know, you crack them and you open them up. And you eat them. A lot of omega-3s. One of the best sources in the vegetable kingdom of omega-3s. Great for your brain. Great to prevent cancer. Great for your energy. Folks that might have diabetes or might have a propensity towards diabetes, great to do walnuts. Almonds are also really good. Just make sure you chew them very, very good so you get all the antioxidants in the almonds. Brazil nuts. Powerful. It's hard to get Brazil nuts. When you go to a, a store and you get the mixed nuts in the can type of thing, it's really hard to get a lot of Brazil nuts. Most cans will say, if, if they're trying to boast, less than 50% peanuts, okay? What that means is you got about 49% peanuts. Peanuts aren't the greatest thing for you. They're not really a nut, they're a bean. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But you don't want to get a can like that. The Brahms out here in Texas has cans of mixed nuts that have... I think no peanuts. If they, I'm pretty sure they have no peanuts and they have a lot of Brazil nuts and other very healthy nuts, including almonds. So this, that's really important. So Brazil nuts, they're the really large ones. That's why they're called Brazil nuts. You know, Brazil being a very large country. Brazil nuts have a lot of selenium in it. The selenium that's in Brazil nuts 
is absorbed very readily in your body. Selenium is great to reduce the chance of certain forms of heart disease and cancer. Brazil nuts, very, very powerful. Keep you satisfied after you eat a few of those. They do have a lot of calories, but they, study after study have shown the more nuts people eat, that tend to be the less weight they need to lose. So that's important. Cashews are also very, very powerful. A lot of antioxidants, including lutein. Lutein is very, very powerful for your skin and for your eyes. Cashews have a ton of it. Cashews are a very important nut. Also, hazelnuts, great stuff, really good for your heart health. Help open up your arteries and the blood flow in your body, great for men. Macadamia nuts, uh, lived in Hawaii for a while. Macadamia nuts were relatively uh, less expensive out there than they are here, but very expensive. But macadamia nuts are very, very healthy for you too. A lot of good fat, good healthy fat in macadamia nuts. So get macadamia nuts if you can. Pecans, believe it or not, I did not know this until I really dug into the research on nuts. Pecans, you know, pecans or pecans, whatever way you pronounce it. I forget how Texas pronounce it. It's different than Southern California and Hawaii. But they have the most antioxidants of any nuts that they've found. That's interesting, isn't it? So... Get those walnuts, pistachios, great for men, great for your blood flow, great to prevent certain prostate problems. Get pistachios if you can, men. And so uh, two or three times a day, a little bit of nuts, like just a, barely enough in your palm, very, very good idea. Certain seeds are also good for you. We'll go over that on another program. Now, back to what Jesus said. With God, all things are possible. Of course, that's all things under his sovereign will and within his nature okay within god's ontology not a matter of you making god your genie or a divine vending machine no it's not about that it must be under his will right but you say well i can't change i can't do it well the more you say that not in the sense of a spiritual problem but a, a physical problem with your brain the more you're inputting that into your brain which is similar in some sense like a computer the more that's going to have an effect on you so you don't want to keep just saying that of course you don't want to lie either what you can say is over the years, it's been a little bit of a challenge for me to change, but I'm determined to pray. And by the power of God, I really, really want to change in this direction. So you're careful on how you phrase it to yourself. So what you're inputting to your brain isn't just defeat. Okay. Again, we're not in this name it and claim it stuff, but we also want to phrase things if we can, you know, in a right way. Being negative is sometimes important. Jesus was negative at times. So we have to keep that in mind. Now, if you say, well, gosh, these things are impossible in life. I've been stuck in this, this second gear my whole Christian life. I can't get out of it. Or I've been trying to do this business startup. It's not working. I've been trying to go back to school. Haven't been able to do it. Well, here it is. With God, all things are possible. Just memorize that. Focus on that. Believe on that. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. A plant, the, the Pethes plant, a few years ago, scientists discovered this particular new species of the Penthes plant. This Nepenthes plant, get this, was eating rats. <laughs> they never seen anything like that. They seen similar, smaller Nepenthes plants eat uh, spiders, tiny bugs, maybe really, really tiny mammals, but never a rat. But they found this new species that can eat rats and mice. So not just the spiders and the bugs, but run. This giant plant eats the mice and the rats it, it lures them in with the sweet nectar. So it, it brings them into the sweet nectar. And then when the rat or the mice gets into the plant, the six, sticky substance traps the rat there. And then the acid comes in and starts degrading and digesting the rat. What a horrible way to die, right? So it gets stuck, it gets trapped, and then it gets digested. Who in the world would have thought that a plant could eat a rat, right? Think that's not possible. It's possible when you study some of the activity in the solar system, whether it's pulsars, whether it's black holes, whether it's dark matter and dark energy, all these things that seemed impossible just a few years ago are possible. And those are physical things. So imagine if we limit ourselves spiritually to what God can and will do under his sovereign will, right? So to be successful at anything, you need to be able to spot an opportunity. Here's one of the keys, especially in today's media with our new social media, with the, the ability to reach millions and millions of people out there, you need to have an open mind to who and how you can reach these people. 
You need to be open to a possible breakthrough. So wellness and even victory come more and more in your life when you trust God and then you have a desire to glorify him and extend that to others. So it's not just about you. It's not just your own selfish life. Specifically, you need to identify a need, a problem, or a breach. Come up with a pioneering, innovative solution so that you can advance and touch others. This particular media platform that you're watching right now, it's unique. That's one reason we've been able to blow it up a little bit. It is a limited one because it talk, talks about apologetics and theology. So there, there, there's only so many people that want to hear that type of stuff. We know that. But there's a lot of people doing that type of activity on social media. So my particular niche that I found is to make sure that I make the case for the certain existence of God. That anybody who has a doubt can understand that their doubt even requires God. That one can have an absolute certitude mentally, emotionally, logically, and spiritually that God must exist. So our platform presses that, uh, placards that, focuses on that, and builds everything from that that all men know God exists, that's impossible for God not to exist, and there's certain proof and evidence everywhere in the world and the universe for God's existence. We're going to get into some more of that later when we talk about a mathematical proof for the existence of God in about 10, 12 minutes, okay? And you're going to see how God must exist. So for me, I found a niche, and I, uh, if you will, exploited it or, or built up around it and, and focused on that. And you can do that in your own life. Whatever niche you want to pray about it, find something that nobody else doing and do it really, really well. Make sure there might be a need, right? You know, and, and go for it. Make sure most of all that it's under God's sovereign will and it lines up with his word. You don't want to do anything against his word. So, so how do you identify problems in business and ministry or career so that you can advance in these areas? Many think that it's often just inborn. You're either naturally good at finding these things or you're not. And that's wrong. Research has found, no, if you put your mind to it and you explore these things, you're open to it and you pray about it, things can happen. Well, then it's probably just a matter of successful experience. Sometimes it is, but not every time, not even most of the time. The key is recognizing opportunities, have an openness in your prayer to God's word, open his word, read his word, memorize his word, and in prayer, utilize his word, and then find these opportunities and then seize them. Be determined to follow through with them. Don't just sit back and let somebody else advance your idea. But you go forward to glorify God. Whether it's a business venture, a career, or your goals for your education, or progression in your ministry, or whatever it is, focus on what I call advancement focused to glorify God. Advancement focus. You have advancement focus and targeting when you think about and you pray about what you will gain if you're successful in this endeavor and how you'll be blessed and how you can bless others and how you can glorify God in it. See how simple that is? It's actually very, very simple. In contrast, if you approach your business or your success target on not risking or losing things or avoiding danger, you are tacitly or indirectly leaning on fear and not hope and faith. Hey, Todd, it's so good to see you. How's things going out there, my brother? It's good to see you, Kevin, Melissa. How's things going? Greetings, uh, Todd from Granbury, Texas here. So good to see you. We're starting to get a, a cold front coming in. We're going to have, um, we're just uh, south of DFW, the Dallas-Fort Worth area for non-Texans in this small town in Granbury. And it's going to be in the 60s, I believe, tomorrow and the next day. And then we're going to get into the 30s and the 20s, which is really cold for out here. So that's going to be happening this weekend. But outside that, everything's going great. My pipes are breaking. My 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 sink and faucet are, are have been broken. My two toilets have been broken. My front yard I had to dig out this week. Uh, uh, pipe, just fun stuff because of some of it, perhaps because of the weather that we had last week when it was really cold, and now it's going to get colder. So we're getting prepared for that out here. <laughs> yes. Hey to you too, Tom. Hey Samuel, it's good to see you, my friend. All right, from India. God bless you, my friend. I'm praying for you. May God keep you and, and bless you and his face shine upon you and all those folks out there. But let, let's keep going here on this. We want to be those who are not worried about risking things. If it's under God's will and lines up with his word, you've talked to some mature Christians about it and say, okay, I want your opinion. I'll, I'll give you an example. 
when I first planted our church in Las Vegas, I was uh, working with a church in, in Maui. Very, very happy, selling real estate, making a ton of money on Maui, Hawaii. I owned condos. I had a, a very uh, wonderful evangelistic ministry and working with this pretty good sized church on Maui and having a really good time. But God really put on my heart to plant a church in Las Vegas. And so when I did that, I went to the elders of the church and I said, okay, and there's much, these were mature guys that knew the word. I said, do me a favor for the next few months before I move, if I move, and I didn't move for nine months to Las Vegas, let me know if you see any red flags on why I should not move to Las Vegas and plant a church. I want to know, do me a favor and tell me. I did not want them just rubber stamping my idea. I wanted to make sure it was God's idea and lined up with his word and that I had accountability with the elders and mature people would speak into my life. So if you have an idea, whether it's with your business or your career or your education or your ministry, talk to two or three mature believers about it and actually be open to what they have to say. Make sure they're not the type of people that are always negative and that kind of stuff or always patch on the back. Make sure that they're mature and they're honest and they'll tell you exactly what they think. Then pray about it and act on it. But you don't want to move in, in fear. You want to move in faith. Moving in fear is prevention targeting. Prevention targeting can be good in some ways, especially in the stock market. Accuracy, dependability, and diligence. And that's what I've been doing with my stock market buys, right? Especially with the market, how, it, how crazy it's been lately. But this does not lead to creativity in your areas that you're thinking about, whether it's ministry, education, or business venture, right? So you need to be an opportunity spotter. And you do that first through prayer. You have to do it through prayer. And then you want to be dominant focused. And that's how you focus on the size of God, that he's massive. He's infinite. He's omnipotent. He's powerful. You want to focus on how incredible God is and not how small you are. Okay. So then you write down your ministry, your business venture, or your career, or your education, or your hobby that you want to advance in, okay? For each goal, make a list of ways in which you can prosper or be blessed, and that you can reach that goal to glorify God, and then help others, and have yourself be blessed. Second, imagine yourself three years away, five years away, maybe 10 years down the road, how you would like to be in that area, whether it's the education, ministry, a career, a business venture, or relationship how where you would you want to be write that down okay write this down because you're going to be praying about this for years if you think you're just going to do it as a christian within the covenant promises of god and say i'm not going to pray about it i'm just going to do it on my own strength no a thousand times no do it under god's power right and then what are your ambitions what are your dreams what would you like to to see fulfilled in your life how would you like to bless others how would you like to glorify god in this and so how do you increase confidence Here's one tip that really, really helped me. As a former professional baseball player, whenever I would think about a project, whether it's uh, my social media platform growing that, whether it's uh, a business venture, whether it's um, a relationship or whatever it is, I, and I wanted to gain some confidence, obviously prayer first, I would do what the Bible says. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. That's in the Bible. Um, Lord, increase our faith. That's also in the Bible. So I do that with a sincerity of heart in my time of prayer. Then I'd also refocus on past accomplishments and I would blow it up in my mind. Like I told you, I used to play professional baseball in the minor leagues and I hit a lot of home runs, a lot of really long home runs. And I can remember a lot of them. So what I would do is I would think back. Oh, I remember when I hit that home run there and went over the fence, over the next fence and onto the freeway and busted a car's windshield. I reflect that on that feeling and how wonderful it was to hit a home run that far and to see the fans cheering the way they did I get in that moment in my own life and ponder that, and that builds my confidence. And there's other things in your life that you can ponder that you were successful in. And you think about, it. now you're not trying to create a new reality, visualize something into existence. You're not doing that. That's of the occult. You don't want to do that. You want to trust God and his power. And if he's going to answer the prayer, he's going to answer the prayer. What you're doing is just building up your own confidence. Part of that building up your confidence is so you go out there and do the work. You go out there on the social media and do the work. And you don't just freeze up and say, oh, I just don't think I can do this. So think of a big win or an achievement in the past, a time when God really, really blessed you and you were successful in your endeavor. You felt really pumped up. Get that feeling again whenever you lack confidence or you just want more confidence. You're going to go talk to a new buyer. Or you're going to talk to a partner. 
or you're going to approach somebody with a social media idea. Whatever it is, think about your past gains, and this is an advancement target. And do this with gratitude. You have to do this with gratitude. Have this complete, utter attitude of gratitude. With, with the fresh air you're breathing, drinking your water, eating your food, your friends and your family, the Word of God, Jesus, the Heavenly Father, the power of the Spirit, you should be so grateful. I am. And I want to be more and more grateful in my life because God has done so much for me. That attitude of gratitude, the more you have that, the more automatic the shift will be into the advancement targeting. That's what you want, advancement targeting. You don't want to just walk around and blah in, in, in neutral and beige. Oh, it'll just happen or it won't. Okay. No, no, you don't want to work like that. You don't want to be a nihilist. You don't want to be someone thinking, well, you know, it, it's all fate. No, it's not. God is sovereign. We know that. But see, it's in a relationship. It's in a covenant relationship unfolding in your life. And that has to do with prayer and talking to God and seeing his will unfold in your life. So uh, make sure that you focus that way and make sure that you look at small, successful improvements towards those major goals. Okay. Small, little improvements towards those major goals and then rejoice in the small gains. The multimillionaire who would be a multi, multi-billionaire if he was alive today, Henry Ford said this, nothing is particularly hard if you divide it into small pieces. Successful people, they reach their desires and their goals by making small, continuous improvements every day. They work hours on their goals. Now, I, I read, I used to read a book a day for over 30 years. That would be one academic book on philosophy, theology, and apologetics on the Bible every day. Plus, I would read more of the Bible, including the Greek and the Hebrew, every single day than I read of the other books. That's a lot of reading. I'm a speed reader, right? Now that I'm a writer, I don't have as much time to read. And you might be able to see some of these books that are stacked up, right? These books that are stacked up are not there by accident. What I do is almost every single day, I try to do it every day, I take about four or five of those books and I only read one or two pages of them. That's it. You say, oh, that's not, that's worthless. Oh, no, it's not. Over week after week after week, even though I don't have as much time as I used to to read, I whittle those books down really fast. That's just reading. That's, that's my thing, right? Whatever you're doing, break down in small things. Tell yourself you're not a slacker, that you're filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. The, the, the power of the Holy Spirit is a word where we get dynamite from. Most of you know that, right? The Holy Spirit is God Almighty. He's a person. He has all power, and he lives in our heart by faith. So, focus on these things. Don't talk to yourself, well, I deserve a day off, and then there's another day off, and another day off, and you don't achieve your goals. Don't think that way. Hello, Harry. So good to see you. Yeah, we don't want to get into word of faith. That's a bunch of a nonsense. Don't want to do that. Forget all that stuff. Forget the Joel Olstein stuff. Forget all those. God's word and his covenant promises are enough. You don't need that stuff. So, when you're at the wee hours of the night is a good time to pray and to ponder your relationship with God, the outworking of that relationship in the ministry, your family, and perhaps some goals you might have with business, your career, or your education. If, so in other words, if you normally get up at seven o'clock in the morning, perhaps get up at six and use that hour for prayer and to focus on some of these goals in your life. Maybe you're, light, you're a night owl like I am. Maybe you stay up an hour later. Maybe instead of going to bed at 1, you go to bed at 2. But pray and focus on these areas when you have least, the least amount of distractions and go forward. Okay, you can do these things. You can do them in Jesus' name. A lot of people think, well, I can never do it. I can never make it. Well, with God, you can. Because with God, all things are possible. That's touching our salvation. And part of our salvation is our place in heaven. That through Christ... We are justified. You've been declared righteous. All your sins washed away. That's the negative aspect of justification. The positive aspect of justification, the righteousness of Christ has been imputed to you, and that's important. Hello, Kenneth. So good to have you, my friend. And so, wow, that's excellent, Harry. List us any good books that you've written or that you've read recently, Harry. Harry is a really good scholar and a friend. Very, very cool, cool man. Um, 
here's a mathematical proof for the existence of God. I promised you this before we would close. Okay. Mathematical proof for God. We know as we talked about the physics of light, how light is an attribute of God and how when it's manifest physically here in our universe, how there's certain mysteries and paradoxes within light that point to God, that God must exist for these saints to be explained at all, right? But it's even better than that. There's absolute certain proof for the existence of God. Many, in fact, everything is a proof for the existence of God, directly or indirectly. I'll give you one right now on mathematics. Since physics, including the physics of study and light, require mathematics. Mathematical truths are absolute, infinite, unchanging, and perfect. Okay? The human brain is not absolute, infinite, unchanging, and perfect. The physical universe is not absolute, infinite, unchanging, and perfect. Thus, the mind, as well as the universe, fail to account for mathematical truths. God is absolute, infinite, unchanging, and perfect. God accounts for mathematical truths there are mathematical truths thus god must exist the contrary is impossible and that's just the way it is that is a proof that is impregnable from any critic or any skeptic and that's just one if you get my book called fake atheism you'll see dozens and dozens and dozens of certain proofs for the existence of god and you can also see how that relates to science in my book that i talked about earlier uh, science requires god and my paperback, which is in Bible colleges and seminaries, you can get God Does Exist by Michael Robinson on Amazon, paperback. A lot of powerful stuff in there, and that would help. Also, most important, our Patreon page. We really, really need folks to help out there. Even if it's a buck, five bucks a month, helps a ton. You can see the link there in the description here on Facebook, as well as when it gets on YouTube. Our YouTube channel is Cross and Crown Radio. If you go there and subscribe, that also helps. There's also a donation button there. And we have books available on Buddhism, refute Buddhism in very unique ways, Hinduism, and all these false religions, cults, including Mormonism, to Witnessism. We discuss President Trump in one of the books. We discuss time travel. We discuss UFOs. All these type of different subjects are on the YouTube channel as well as my books, and you can check that out. Now, one time, George Steinbrenner, I used to be a Yankee fan. Don't hate me for that, especially now that I'm in Texas. I'm no longer really a sports fan at all. I think for me, not for everybody, I think it can be a, there's a place for sports in maybe the average person's life, but not for me as a former professional baseball player. I was a, a Yankee fan before I made it in the minor leagues because Reggie Jackson, I really, really liked him. And so uh, as a Yankee fan, I remember a story of George Steinbrenner when he first bought the Yankees, right? He was a big military guy. And in spring training, his first spring training, he sees Lou, P Lou Pinello, who had really long hair. And Steinbrenner said, no, you gotta cut that hair. Your, your hair's way too long, Lou, you gotta cut it. And Lou said this, Jesus Christ had long hair and it worked for him. But Steinbrenner didn't say anything. The next day, Steinbrenner takes uh, Lou Pinella across the street. He points to a lake and he says, Lou, when you can walk across that lake, you can grow your hair long. <laughs> and so Lou Pinella cut his hair after that. It's very important. And if you don't know Jesus, you need to know that he died on the cross for our sins. He was buried and rose again on the third day. King William III made a proclamation when he, was, when he beat back and beat down the revolution in Scotland. He said this in his proclamation that all rebels who come and take an oath of allegiance to the king by December 31st will be, would be pardoned. McIan was a prominent leader of the clan. He was resolved to take the oath, but because of his pride, he wanted to take it last. So he postponed starting out on the trip and he waited two days before the expiration of the pardon. Then suddenly a snowstorm came and slowed down his journey before he could take the oath to receive the pardon the time was passed for the pardon. It was too late because of the snowstorm. While all the, all the other rebels had made it on time and received the pardon and allowed to live and return home, McIan was horribly put to death because he put off and he delayed. He started out too late. And if you're thinking you can put this off, you can't. 
you come to Jesus tonight. You've heard the gospel. The word and the spirit has touched your heart. You turn from your sins and you come to Jesus right now. And you say something like, Father, I believe. If, you, if you're sincere with this and you come to Christ, you come to God, say, Father, I believe in Jesus. I believe he's the son of God and the son of man. I believe Jesus died on the cross for all my sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead on the third day. This I believe. I receive in my heart, my life, and I'll turn from my ways and follow him all the days that I live. Amen and amen. If that's you, you can write us and we'll send you a free book. Any of the 43 books I've written, we'll give you two of them for free. We'll pay the postage. No big deal. And don't forget my book, Fake Atheism, is also on Amazon. That's a, a, a one of my newer books, and I think you, you might like it. But I really appreciate all you guys and gals out there. Keep us in prayer. We're trying to grow this from thousands to tens of thousands, and then even more if we can. We know there seems to be at least some limitations on apologetics ministry, that there's not the biggest scope for it, but we want to see the scope enlarged because people really, really need to know why Christianity is true. There's so much nonsense, so much garbage out there, so much trash out there. They need to know the truth and to be able to defend the truth. And so we're here to do that. Just go to our Patreon page. The link, like I said, is in that description of this YouTube uh, video as well as the Facebook uh, video that's playing right now. But until next time, this is Pastor Mike Robinson saying, may God richly bless you. Hey guys, you can really help us if you donate to our worldwide media outreach. Just go to our Patreon page at Mike Robinson Apologetics on Patreon, or click the donate button on our main page on YouTube and give as the Lord leads. Thank you so much.